Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of this course. Here we will start working into the course itself and since we're starting out from an already finished model and we're just going to color it and get the UV maps and emission map in order to work on it, I want to make a small parenthesis and explain briefly the use of the polygroups because polygroups are a concept that we'll have to know and use in order for this to work, okay? As many of you know, polygroups allow us to arrange the mesh with an easier visual information. In a way, what polygroups do is allow us to handle an object separately despite having an adjacent mesh. When working with separate objects, it's very easy to set different materials or work that object separately because obviously they're two separate objects. But when we want to have just an object and work that object with different materials, for example, it's more complicated. It's kind of a mesh organizer, so to speak, or a mesh mask. Okay, so for you to understand it, here we have two spheres. You see both are gray and they have the same, like, well, they're actually white. They're the same color. But besides this color, the real one, if we hide the lines and select this option here, we'll see one sphere has a polygroup in this color and the other one has a polygroup with the same color. We can go now to the visible group and change this polygroup's color. Both this one and this one. Okay? We only see the polygroup selected at the moment. So if we have this object selected, we'll only see this one we won't be able to see the other one. As I'm saying, when working separate, it's very easy, but when we want to join two objects within a continuous mesh, but work on them separately, it's more complicated, and all of this, we can achieve it using polygroups. If we now join these two objects, clicking on Merge Down, we can see we have one subtool, that is one object, but consisting of two polygroups. We can disable polygroups and work with it. You see, we can move one sphere and then the other one. But what happens if we join these? Let's see, we create a mask for a moment and we join it like this. And now let's say I want to work on this part, but without affecting this other one here. Or I can't see what's inside because this element is blocking my view. And we also have these elements together, so this complicates things. But since these two are in different polygroups, despite being the same model and the mesh being contiguous, Holding Ctrl, Shift and Alt, we can select each polygroup forming the object. See? As we'll see along the course, these can be applied to many other situations, and we can make polygroups many ways. We can, for example, create a mask holding Ctrl, and inside the polygroup menu, we can mask the group, So if we click this option, we can see we paint the mask of a different polygroup. I insist that the color remains the same, both are white, okay? But if we click the polygroup option, we'll see the different polygroups this object is made of. And if we hold Ctrl, Shift, Alt and click a polygroup, we select it. Sometimes it looks like some polygroups have the same color. 
but every new polygroup we create will be a different color. And though it looks the same, don't worry about that because they're different polygroups. So if we create another mask, you see it will be a different color and always a different polygroup. All right, now that we understand this concept, we can open the file provided with the course. As you can see here, we already have the image, the work, in different polygroups. So you see the spiked mushrooms being a similar color to this character scape, or the color of the leaves. I insist the polygroup's color is different. So if I use Ctrl Shift Alt on the mushrooms, only the mushrooms are selected. You see we have the sub tool here and obviously I've been working in all these separately. And then I merged all these elements. Another important thing when merging elements is, well, I'm going to hide this work for a moment. So here I have two spheres. And as I was saying, another important thing when merging objects so we don't lose subdivision levels or have problems is that when merging them, we have to make sure they have the same level of subdivision. For example, if this sphere has four subdivision levels, we make sure that the one below it has also four subdivision levels. This way, if we merge down both, you'll see they keep the four subdivision levels. If one had three and the other one had four, we would have problems. This way we can go from level one through four. As I was saying, I worked this model part by part. Rocks, mushrooms, Everything was separate, so when I finished modeling everything and applying all these furrows and details on the surface, I had four subdivision levels on each element, okay? The leaves, the tree, any element. So I clicked on Merge Down in order to join everything in a unique piece. Since everything had four subdivision levels, I didn't lose any detail or subdivision level. See? Notice here on level one that all this scene is optimized enough so it has 55,000 polygons. It's a quite important quantity. Try especially when we make models consisting of only one subtool. I mean, scenes like this one grouped in one subtool not to exceed the minimum subdivision level. If we get to 8,000 or 100,000 polygons, we probably won't be able to work. So always, as a rule, the less the better. I did it in one object because it will be easier to work with later. If we had many objects, it would be a bit more messy. With just one object, we will get just one color texture, one emitter texture, and we will work on everything from one texture. Though, of course, a good way to do it would be separately, but it would take us quite more time, all right? As you see, the minimum subdivision level is 55,000, and if we take it to the maximum, we get 3.5 million polygons. So be careful because depending on the PC you have, it can slow down a bit. So if it does, you can always take it one subdivision level down and press delete higher. So three becomes the highest subdivision level. All right. 
In this case, with three and a half million, it's fine. Since I worked the elements separately, I was careful enough to keep a different polygroup for each element. This way, for example, rocks are only one polygroup, then sand is a different polygroup, water is a different polygroup. Notice that each element, except for example, the leaves that are together, in order for do all of these in a 100% elaborate way, we would have to go selecting each leaf and painting it as a different polygroup. And the same in order to unfold the textures as best as possible. We will have to work harder on all of these, okay? But since we're going to be applying flat colors without any texture, we don't care about this because we'll get the power of the scene through illuminating these emitters we have around here like these, these fireflies we have around here, and, for example, the lantern, there's the key to make a more powerful scene. We won't work on the color too much, it will be very simple, and, as I'm saying, we'll get the lights through the materials. All right, so if we hold Control shift alt as you know, we select each item separately. And clicking here, we activate polygroups. See? Notice we have the eyeball separate even. It will also help us paint with different colors and choose each part. I mean, if we want to paint, for example, the rocks one color and the trees a different color, or leaves, or any other element, all right? Before we start painting, I would advise you to Google a color palette we could be interested in. Like, for example, this one here. Yeah. Yeah, that's not bad, right? We can choose any elements we see or any palette we like and work with it. Or we can also use one of those websites that generate color palettes. Like this one right here, for example. Here's the URL. Just hit Start Generator. And we will get this viewer, which we can modify in order to generate different color palettes. If we click on the colors, we can select a different shade of the color and we can even change the order of the colors in the palette. We can also tweak some parameters of the palette like saturation, brightness, temperature. There's loads of websites with this type of palette generator so you can look around and use the one you like the most. We can export the palette with the color HTML code so it's easier to use them wherever you need. In this case, we're going to use this palette I saved earlier. Let's see. Uh, ah, there it is. So, We'll work with this palette, so we just have to open it on Photoshop and use the eyedropper tool to identify the color's parameters and write them down. If you have a second screen, it's easier because you can move the panel to the other screen and we can copy the numbers at once. I'm going to do it like this, but you, if you have pen and paper, you can write them down. So let's start painting. As I said, it's going to be a very easy task and in order to do it, we're going to use the polygroups because we have everything grouped. 
Basically, we will just hold Ctrl, Shift and Alt in order to select the parts we want to paint. Then switch to Photoshop and hit the eyedropper. I have the eyedropper panel in the second screen, so I'll be telling you the codes. We click Color, Inset Brush, and we enter the values of the color. In this case, it's red, 142, hit Enter. Green, 191, hit Enter to jump to the next field. And blue, 180, Enter. And we get this color. Then just hit Fill Object to paint the material with this color. As you know, we can paint only the color or we can change the material. This is the material. Material and color are two different things. So we can choose a different material and we can paint only the material selecting M up here and selecting Fill Object. Now, as you see, we just painted the object with a different material. This is irrelevant right now since we'll boost the real power of the scene later on. And at the moment, we'll just use simple very simple colors and materials. So let's select um, this one here, Matt's Cap Skin 5, and choose MRGV in order to paint both material and color. Then hit Fill Object and Control shift alt and the selected. Now let's paint this other part here. So Control shift alt select it. Switch to Photoshop and choose the color. This one right here. You can slightly modify the colors if you'd like some kind of variation in the chromatic range. Hit OK now. And let's copy these codes back to ZBrush, hit color, and enter 224 for red, 218 for green, and 185 for blue. Then hit fill object. We have MRGB color enabled, so we keep painting both material and color. All right. We'll do the same with each element. So you can choose the colors you like, take a different color palette as a reference. You're completely free. It really doesn't matter that much because it'll be a very nocturnal scene, though we can get a daylight scene too. But mainly it will be a night scene where basically colors won't be seen much and what will provide most of the color will be the light the materials themselves emit. So don't worry too much about the color and why not? You can experiment with different colors. Let's select the rocks now. For example, they could be this color. So again, hit color and set red to 96 green to 78, and blue to 83. Now hit Fill Object. You realize little by little we're painting the scene. Let's click File and save our work so far. And we'll end this part here. All right, I don't want this lesson to be longer because this first part was mainly, especially at the beginning of the video, about explaining polygroups and using this scene as an example. So, see you later.